some thoughts on our weekly dialogue forum. I, Randhir Kumar Gautam, on behalf of Viswanidham Center for Asian Blossoming, welcome you to talk in a very special weekly dialogue on the very topic, Anthropology in Dangerous Times. We have with us, as a speaker of today's session, Eli Maria Pramchel. She is from Greek, and she is a deep seeker of anthropology. She is a tutor of anthropology, and she has deep love towards anthropology and understanding primitive culture. I welcome also Professor Anantegiri, moderator of today's session, and also a speaker of today's session. He is a professor from Madras Development Institute and also uh, honorary trustee of Viswanidhan Center. We welcome our friend, Professor Gyan Gului, Maniti Pradhanji, Pooja Soniji, Professor Meera Chakravarti, and all friends. Uh, uh, let me also give a brief introduction to our Swadhesha Chakra circuit. It is a circle of co-learning and mutual studies, which is a kind of initiative of studying and learning together self, culture, and societies and the world. Friends who are associated with these are eager to walk and mediate with new horizons of thinking and new movements of social cultural change at work in our contemporary world. We study seekers such as Maharshi Arvindo, a great uh, philosopher from India. We study seekers of the work of Mahatma Gandhi, father of India and a prophet of peace of all over the world. We study seekers of Chitranjan Das, a creative soul from uh, Orisha, a belong to a state in India. So we invite people like uh, Ili to share with us their knowledge and their understanding and help us to think uh, mutually in a process of dialogue and in a process of intercultural dialogue. So today we have a very special topic called Understanding Anthropology in Dangerous Times. As you know, we live in a time where capitalism works rapidly and the whole hegemony of modernity is so high that we are forgetting our ancient past, our forgetting our roots. So in this time, thinking about anthropology or thinking with anthropologists insights is very challenging and very, very, uh, uh, very, very uh, important also in other side, because we can see a rising of the uh, ethnic uh, consciousness emerging all over the world. And, and in, 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 in this context, uh, oh thinking God. about the topic uh, of today's like oh anthropology God. in our uh, uh, times, which is very dangerous, is very important. So without further ado, I would like to invite dear speaker and respected speaker of uh, today's session, Eli Maria Pampachil, to share her insights on the very topic. So over to you. Yes. Thank you very much. I have to say that uh, India, is a country that is in my heart. And I have never been to India, but if you come to my house, you think you are in India. Because I have a very good friend who has a house there and she always brings me things. So all my Indian friends, when they come here, they say, ah, I feel at home. So at some point, I hope I will be able to visit you because this is my dream to come to your country. So about why did recording stop?
Okay, now it's in progress again. Um, so I'd like to talk about anthropology. Many anthropologists, if you ask them why did they follow this path, they will answer that <clears throat> something in their life happened. They came in touch with people that are, were different than the people they grew up with. And this gave birth and sparked an interest to what we now understand in anthropology as the other. And my first memories of being interested in the other, in a very broad sense of the word, in the sense of people who were different from the people in my family or in our social circle. I think the first uh, memories go back when I was uh, maybe five or six years old. And so I went to a school, <clears throat> the public school in Greece. And at that school, there were children from all social classes. There were very poor children and middle-class children and rich children. And I remember uh, seeing this girl and she must have been very poor. There was, it was winter and she didn't have shoes. So she came with plastic sandals, but she was wearing two or three pairs of socks, very uh, hot, warm socks, you know, uh, woolen socks that were uh, uh, made in the traditional um, way that they make them now only in some villages. And then she would bring her lunch and her lunch was uh, homemade bread and some I would actually give her some toys and so on. But the real reason was I wanted to study her because she was so different than me. And then when I was six and a half, we moved to South Africa for almost two years. And then in South Africa, of course, uh, uh, the biggest population is the black population and that was apartheid. And I was six and a half and seven and seven and a half. And I was already thinking that something is very, very wrong. And my father, who was a very liberal person, uh, would ask the black nanny who looked after me and my brother, who was much younger, six years younger, uh, to sleep in the house, you know. And she would say, no, 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 I cannot sleep under the same roof uh, because the apartheid didn't allow it. You know, they, the, the, the black people had their own little house in the garden and, and she wouldn't sleep, you know, in the house and she wouldn't accept to eat at the same table like us. So as a six year old, all this to me looked very wrong, but more than wrong, it looked fascinating. So the time passed and then we returned to Greece and so on. And in Greece, they didn't offer anthropology and I had not discovered anthropology. So I studied, in the beginning, I studied um, interior architecture and a theater. And while I was studying these uh, at the same time, I discovered anthropology and then Everything in my life made sense. It's like when I discovered anthropology, life made sense to me. All these questions of why there is inequality, why there are people that don't have uh, enough to eat, why there is so much wealth in the world. Uh, it, it suddenly the, the mechanism of oppression began to, to dawn on me and I started studying on my own a lot. And I have a, an interesting story because uh, actually there is a historical reason why in Greece it was quite late that we established uh, anthropology at university. Uh, 
the reason was that Greece's first anthropologist was actually a royalty, and he is Prince uh, Peter of Greece and Denmark. He was, he died. And before the war, he had, um, he was almost engaged. He was in love with uh, Frederica, who later became queen of Greece. And Prince Peter had a very interesting story because although he was royalty, he was very open-minded, very democratic, and he fought against the Nazis. So his mind was open. So they were going in Germany on horseback with Friederike, and they were in love, a young couple, both very beautiful. And Friederike gets off her horse, and she had a Swiss knife, and on a tree, she carves their initials, P for Peter and F for Friederike in a heart. Some a very common thing that many lovers do. But under that, she put the sign of Nazi. Her father was Kaiser and she was, uh, um, uh, at that point, of course, all the horrible things of the Nazi had not come out, but still, she was affiliated with the ideas of Nazi. So Peter broke the engagement that minute. He said, this point is where you and I finish. We are done. There is no future. I'm a, I believe in democracy, not in Nazi. So we are gone. So Frederica went on to marry um, his cousin and then she later became queen of Greece. But she never forgave uh, Prince Peter because he rejected her romantically. And she fought everything that he represented. It happened that he represented anthropology. He studied with Branislaw Malinowski, the father of British anthropology. Uh, Malinowski died quite young. He was not even 60, quite suddenly. And so, and Peter joined the army. He fought as a soldier, so he interrupted his studies in anthropology. His PhD in 1959, and it was signed by uh, Raymond Firth. There is also another very interesting side in Peter. His mother was Maria Bonaparte, and Maria Bonaparte was the last of the Bonapartes uh, from Napoleon Bonaparte, and she was an intellectual. Uh, she underwent therapy with Sigmund Freud, and then she studied with Sigmund Freud, and she became a psychoanalyst herself. So this was a fascinating time because it was the beginning of anthropology and the first steps of psychoanalysis and so forth. And we have the coming together of many thinkers like Freud and Malinowski. And one of the things that they were wondering was to what extent does the Oedipus complex uh, is found among what back then they would call uh, primitive cultures. We do not use this term anymore. We talk about indigenous cultures, of course, or traditional cultures. But back then, even uh, the father of anthropology did use the word primitive. And that is a very interesting uh, question. The Oedipus complex, is it something that uh, manifests primarily within modern societies, or is it something that is found within other systems of organization? So Prince Peter, inspired by Malinowski and Freud, went on to Tibet to carry out field work, which he did very much successfully among the rare uh, polyandrous communities where one woman marries all the men 
brothers of one family. And she does this because one man is not enough to secure financially a woman. Um, I would not go into the work of Prince Peter now because I want to return to the basic question of uh, anthropology in dangerous times. This was the title that my colleague Michael Harkin and I gave to an article we had published in American Anthropological Association in 2018, uh, based, inspired by Prince Peter's um, story, but also looking at Greece's story. So, um, the idea and the question that is important to look at is how can anthropology help in dangerous times, whether this is during the past time of the Nazis or today. Until very recently in the United States, we had the uh, we had Trump and Trump. Uh, was really uh, the administration of Trump was a dangerous situation for many reasons, because you mentioned Mahatma Gandhi. So we have Mahatma Gandhi, we have Nelson Mandela, we have all these people who fought and fought and fought for liberation, for equality, for human rights. So now we cannot go back. We cannot go back and forget that poor people have rights and women have rights and disabled people have rights and children have rights and everybody has rights. And, and we cannot go back. I personally believe that anthropology is a unique tool to fight oppression. Anthropology is a unique tool and it must be taught from kindergarten on at all levels, regardless of what path one takes. If you are a doctor or a lawyer or an economist or a businessman or a teacher or anything you do in life, you must have some knowledge of anthropology because it, it is what will safeguard a person. I personally have not discovered any other tool as effective against falling in the trap of believing um, in the ideas of Trump or in the ideas of Hitler or in the ideas of colonialism. And as civilization, we know that now, unfortunately, we are at the not make it. The planet will actually be okay. It's not the planet that is in danger. It is the human civilization because humans will not be able to live with climate catastrophe. And if you look at climate catastrophe, really what is uh, in the heart of everything that has gone wrong, climate catastrophe primarily, but not only climate catastrophe, is human greed to accumulate more than one needs. And there is nothing wrong with building some fortune perhaps, but after a certain extent, if you your main goal in life is only material success. There is a problem there. And there is, this is the problem that is behind climate change and behind colonialism and behind all forms of oppression. And this is greed. So if I have a message today, it is that I believe that we should open the discussion on how anthropology can help in addressing the 
the fault of human nature that concentrates on greed because we have to fight with everything we have for what Mahatma Gandhi fought, Nelson Mandela, and all liberation activists in the story of humans. I have to apologize. I was not prepared uh, because this has not been an easy period for me, too much work. And during uh, the holidays, I had a very bad case of COVID. I'm well now, completely well, but all the work has accumulated. So this was not a very organized uh, speech. So please forgive me, but it was wonderful coming in touch with all of you. And I want to thank Rand here very much for his uh, 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 invitation, and I hope I didn't waste too much of your time with my speech. Thank you uh, so much uh, for your uh, simple but a very heart-touching uh, uh, deliberation. And uh, as you have rightly mentioned, the task of anthropology is to save the culture, save the race from the colonizers from the enemy of all. And uh, this is a kind of invitation for all of us to engage with this question of existence in the very time of which we call dangerous time. And this is dangerous because we have created this dangerous in the name of capitalism, in the name of colonization. Uh, so for further uh, dialogue and uh, uh, for further uh, engagement with the topic, I would like to invite Professor Anand Kumar Giri, who is a well-known anthropologist in India, a very significant understanding of anthropology and the world. So, Anand Bhai, over to you. Please say some of your thought and meditation. As uh, Anantagiri is taking some time, uh, I would like to uh, ask uh, some of our respected discussant to share some of his or her reflections on the very topic. So I would like to invite Dr. Gyan Gului to share some thoughts on the very topic. Dr. Gyan is from Italy and uh, he's one of our collaborators and help us. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. It was really very interesting. Uh, well, I know I'm not a particular expert on anthropology uh, in contemporary times, except for having read something of Levi Strauss. But what I was thinking about is that in a certain sense, we have attempts to make an anthropology also enhancing the Greek philosophy because, for instance, the owl uh, dealing of Plato, for instance, with uh, the human soul in the different dialogues, I'm thinking, for instance, of Phaedrus, but also and mostly of the Republic, kind of the structure of the soul in the Republic is a kind of uh, of course, investigation on the soul and on anthropology of the soul, of the anthropology of the, yes, a study of the, of the anthropological condition of the soul. And what I think is it is not only that, but it is only in a certain sense an exhortation to be aware uh, how the human soul is made and to be aware to which dangers the human soul constitutively is exposed unless the human soul receives the new formation and the new education. But I think that one of the greatest worries of Plato in the Republic and not only in the Republic, when he is speaking of uh, the soul is to show that uh, the soul 
finds constitutive itself in a state, in a condition of instability. That is, it is really very, very easy for the soul and therefore for the human being to uh, go uh, towards a bad path and to make a bad path up to the complete degeneration. It is impressive not only how Plato introduces the question of the soul in the fourth book of the Republic, for instance, because he there already says, pay attention, there is only one form of good constitution of the soul, but the all other forms are, are a danger. Uh, but there is not only this, which is already quite impressive as such, but I think it is also impressive that the, 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 the investigation, the inquiry, which Plato makes into the degeneration of the soul and the possibility of degeneration of the soul in the eighth and the ninth book of the Republic. Also, there's those, also that is a profound study of anthropology of all, also, well, usually it is not seen in this way as an anthropological study, but I think that we could apply the question of anthropology also to, to some parts of Plato. And also there, there, mostly there in Republic 8 and 9, we can see that Plato says it is really very easy to degenerate. And once the degeneration has begun, it becomes difficult and difficult, more and more difficult to stop it. So I think that uh, we can uh, also from the ancient times, we can learn very much from also in an, anthropology, in, an, in an anthropological perspective, also from the text of the ancient Greek philosophy, not only from Plato, but very much from Plato indeed. But anyway, it was really very interesting and I take many, many notices. I thank you very much for your brilliant exposition. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, Eli, would you like to respond? That was an excellent response. Thank you. And I agree. I agree. Uh, I think an emphasis is uh, also in uh, decolonization. And when we're talking about decolonization, there are areas that have been affected by colonialism that many of us don't even um, imagine. For example, the way we treat children. Children and people who are not white people and other cases, women and so forth, and poor people and what so forth, disabled people, you know, they were treated like less intelligent and their voice as less important. So for example, in the previous maybe generation, but even now some people will say, children must do as they are told. And this is actually the, the basis of colonial thought like the colonized people must do as they are told. And when a child is brought up to do as he is told, we actually lose what this child has to offer. His fresh thinking, his, his voice, his imagination and so forth. And we construct children on the path of the colonial example. So there's many, many areas of life that we need to re-examine because at this point in history, I think we do not have a choice. We will either go back to the dark times or we have to make sure that we move into the light, so to speak, and freedom and and so forth. And two days ago, there was again another horrible instance in the United States where a black man was brutally beaten to death by a policeman for no reason at all, just because he was black, you know. And 
And there are many such incidents today in the world. And um, we, we have to see how we as thinkers and from the academia, we have to go down and, and see how we can take the knowledge we have to put it on in practice, to put it on the streets, to, to make our knowledge matter. That's all for now. Yes, uh, so Anantabai has just joined. So I request uh, Anantabai to share some of his reflections. Hello. <laughs> uh, so I should say Aparisto. <laughs> so I think you speak Greek. I should say Aparisto. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you. And I have been. <laughs> Ellie, thank you. So you are from Greece? I am from Greece. Um, I was born in South Africa, but left when I was two months old. And I went uh -huh. to Egypt. My parents were living in Egypt. And uh, uh -huh. then I came to Greece when I was uh, two years old. Then I went back to South Africa for two years. Then I came back to Greece. Then I lived for a while in the United States. Uh, my, my three grandparents are Greek and my, my one grandmother was uh, white South African. Uh, so I'm very mixed, you know. How lovely. And that may be this story connects to a very deeply evocative story of another anthropologist uh, whose name you might have heard. His name is Andre Bete. Uh, he's a very noted sociologist and anthropologist of India and the world. And uh, I wish to begin with his story called My Two Grandmothers. <laughs> and that is uh, part of his autobiography called uh, Sunset on the Garden. No, it is called Sunrise on the Garden. And uh, I think uh, in terms of understanding anthropology in danger, one important source is autobiography. And, uh, and because um, how in very difficult circumstances, people have coped with the challenges of the time and how people have coped with the danger and found some creative ways. In this essay, Professor Bethe writes that how he was born into a French father, thus having a French grandmother and a Brahmin uh, mother and having a Brahmin grandmother. And uh, so this double genealogy, this multiple genealogy, what uh, has happened that when Andre Bethe studies Indian society and he already has a very insider come not so, uh, you know, engaged or as not so insider a perspective, because these two grandmothers have given him already born in India, has given him already a kind of an anthropological sense of distancing. And in another essay, uh, Professor Bethe has an essay called Anthropology and Marxism, in which he is saying, that if Marxism stands for commitment and anthropology, according to Levi-Strauss, views from afar, then it is very challenging to bring these two things together. And uh, we realize that anthropologists, when they study other societies, now politically they are very vulnerable. And uh, therefore, the kind of criticality that you are expecting from anthropologists. In reality, it is a challenging task. So, for example, I have done some study in the USA and I could feel that how non-welcoming Americans are uh, for somebody just to come into their community and try to understand it. But in my own society, if I develop, I bring an anthropological engagement, then there is a possibility of that engagement, that insight, you know, being overflowing into many domains and thus 
becoming part of a critical force of transformation. So therefore, anthropology in danger in the context of dangers of time and society, especially political danger. And uh, it is in that context, one way that anthropology can challenge, come up to the challenge is an anthropology of one's own society. But an anthropology of one's own society, which is not too much kind of insider perspective, because anthropology having that double engagement of the insider and the outsider, that way it is very much phenomenological. So we need that kind of an anthropological engagement where we are in our society and we understand our society critically as well as trans-societally through with a comparative global engagement and with kind of collaboration that we can develop with many other actors of society, social movements, public policy actors, critical public policy actors, you know, that way uh, we become a force in society. And my final submission is that your expectation that anthropology should be taught you know, from the childhood, that's very interesting. But that way anthropology is a discipline as well as a transdisciplinary journey. The great philosopher Sundararajan from India, he has a very interesting thought, he says that any discipline that we go with, what really remains is a perspective that can be universalized. That way, what is that uh, salience in anthropology which needs to be universalized? I would submit that it is that sense of being with a person, listening to an undeniable human voice, not reducing it to that number. And that perspectivality, that engagement is not just discipline. It is a kind of perspectivality which needs to be cultivated in all disciplines, economics, philosophy. Similarly, some uh, thoughts from other disciplines. So uh, I think you are not uh, pleading for a disciplinarity, but kind of a perspective you know, that anthropology gives, which though nurtured in the garden of anthropology, but it really flows into the garden of life. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, while uh, uh, remembering your uh, insight as spreadly, who once said, what is to be an ethnographer? And uh, I would like to quote him. He said, I want to understand the world from the point of view. I want to know what you know in the way you know it. And I want to understand the meaning of your experience, to walk in your shoes, to feel things as you feel them, to explain things as you explain them. So this is the whole uh, quest of indigenous knowledge is the representation of truth. And being an anthropologist, being an ethnographer, that journey of uh, representation of truth becomes a kind of easy task. So uh, this is something which is uh, very much needed. And uh, this is the whole uh, uh, quest of anthropologists in uh, today's time. So uh, dear and uh, respected participant, if you have any question or queries or any comments, please uh, indicate me in the chat box uh, and ask your question. Meanwhile, uh, I would like to invite uh, Pooja Soni, uh, who is uh, uh, one of a deep seeker of philosophy, to say some thoughts and reflection on the very topic. Thank you, Randir. Uh, but you have put me in the spot right now. Um, but it's interesting. Ellie spoke about um, um, 
the relation between anthropology and psychoanalysis. So I see that anthropology and psychoanalysis have this um, commonality in subjectivity, which is of interest to me. And uh, um, 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 so um, Ellie, I, I would like to ask you if, if you see, um, you know, like um, anthropology getting into um, uh, psychoanalysis and, uh, and, and if you can share any examples of, do these two disciplines interact or are they completely different? Because anthropology, we, could, we can say that it's close to po uh, political science and, and so on, and it's, it's mostly objective. And psychoanalysis is, is, um, is objective, but it has to do with language. So my question would be, uh, what do you see the role of language, the ideas and so on? Because every culture has its own language and, and how we use language could say a lot about how people do anthropology in their own country. Um, so yeah, I would like to know your thoughts about um, language and its effect on how we do anthropology. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I see that like two different questions. Um, absolutely, there is a connection between anthropology and um, psychoanalysis. Um, in the first steps of the discipline of anthropology with the starting point of Malinowski, and uh, Freud with the starting point of psychoanalysis, uh, there was this uh, scholar, Reja, um, uh, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. Uh, give me one minute, please. Uh, Raiham. And yeah, Giza Raiham. So he was a young anthropologist who was also trained in psychoanalysis. And I think he was the first one, at least in that time, that tried to combine the two. But as I said, um, even from the first steps, Malinowski was very interested in the psychoanalytic aspect of the people. He studied the Trobrianders of uh, New Guinea, which was a matriarchal society. <coughs> So a lot of discussion started with the role of the father. We know from Annette Weiner who studied the uh, Trobriander's 60 years after Malinowski. So she had the benefit of 60 years uh, of anthropological thought, how it had developed, number one, and number two as a woman and so forth. She was able to focus more on the lives of women and by doing that she understood also more the role of men. <laughs> so we have a very interesting uh, example of the Trobrianders where um, because it's a, a, a matrilineal community and culture that the, the children take the name of the mother and the important um, male in their lives is the mother's brother. Now the children know who their father is, but their father will take care and be a father role of his sister's children. But all of this, of course, I'm just saying it very simplistically right now, uh, is much more complicated and deeper. But it, it gives us an idea that according to cultural contexts, psychoanalysis can change and it does change because the idea we have in a modern society of what a mother should do, of what a father should do, or a child that grows up without a father, which is becoming more and more common uh, nowadays. So how does that affect a person's psychoanalytic makeup and consequently a cultural psychoanalytic makeup. 
so I think that there is definitely a connection between anthropology and psychoanalysis. But then again, I also think that there is definitely a connection with anthropology and every other discipline there is. I mean, we have anthropology of business, for example. We have anthropology of shipping. I mean, there is no discipline that cannot connect to anthropology. And I agree with Amanta Giri very much that it's not just about anthropology we have to discuss, but about every other discipline that we have to look at how the perspective shifts in a way and pays more attention to liberation movements and so forth and decolonialization and so forth. Now about language, that's a very, very interesting topic. You brought this up. And uh, Bourdieu, of course, uh, did some fascinating work on, uh, and, and other thinkers, of course, uh, Bourdieu was one of them, uh, on language and the role that language plays. Um, but right now I cannot think off my head something about uh, connecting anthropology and psychoanalysis and uh, language. The only thing that comes to my mind, of course, is that the choice of language, the choice of words, the choice of, you know, um, and the language per se, because there's uh, colonized languages and, and the weight that languages have and, uh, you know, the language of the oppressed people. And we have all these examples of people who are not allowed to speak their mother tongue uh, in the official system, for example, at school. Um, so, so I see a connection there as well. How does that uh, uh, psychoanalysis can address this well? Um, so, 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 so yes, there's a lot of connection in these areas. Any other friend would like to have any kind of intervention? Yes, uh, Miniti Pradhan ji has raised. Please ask your question. Uh, hello, am I audible? Yes. Good evening, everyone. First, I would like to thank uh, Professor Eli, Maria, Papa Michel for our very deep presentation and uh, for Anantabhai as usual for um, very insightful deliberation. I have uh, one question about to Anantabhai or ma'am, whoever can answer. I want to know what are the ways to make the population look at all the incidents in an anthropological way? Or, you know, like how do we engage all the streams into the transdisciplinary journey? Thank you. Excuse me, can, can you please repeat your question a little bit? Hello. Yeah. Yes, I was yes. asking the first question. Yes. What are the ways to make all the population look at all the incidents, you know, like an anthropological view? Because uh, if you are an anthropologist, you look at an incident into uh, means whatever views, not everyone looks at uh, in that view. So what are the ways you can make the population look at the incidents in the anthropological view? It was the question. And uh, the other part of the, uh, yeah. Well, if I understood your question well, uh, I'm not sure I understood it well, but if I understood it well, I think that, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, when we talk about decolonizing thinking, we have to decolonize thinking, and this affects areas we, we don't usually think, like children. So, for example, when children are given a chance to develop their own voice. And this can mean various things. For example, in the ways that many of us were brought up, maybe most of us, when we were children, we were accepted only if we behaved in a certain way. We had to be polite, we had to say thank you, you know, please. And we had to not scream or not make, um, you know, noise or whatnot. 
But if we think about this in an open box, why should we accept children only when they behave in a certain way? What does that make a child feel? It will feel that my mother or my father or my society or my teacher accepts me and says bravo to me only when I have the good manners, the good grades, and so on and so on. But if we accept a child even when they are not polite and not good grades and not good behavior, then this child will learn to love themselves in a much deeper way. And there have been such experiments, few experiments, but there have been a few experiments. And these children that grew up un with unconditional love and uh, out of, of a box of expectancy, then these children are able to, to create a world and a society and so forth that has in its core values what we are trying to, to do with anthropology. I'm not being very clear here. It's like having a knot, okay? So there's a knot and we have to untangle this knot. But we are trying to un untangle this knot as academics with the thinking we have from books and the experience we have with working with people with ethnography. But perhaps, this is a question, I don't know, I'm changing, perhaps if we change to a really free, democratic, liberal, non-colonized way thinking from the, from down, from, from, the, from childhood, from the beginning, then maybe we won't have that knot to untangle. I don't know if that makes sense. That is one way I can think of this perspective, you know, uh, reaching the wider population. I will just say one last thing. I have often said that it's very interesting and it's very important to pay attention to oppressors. So for example, we have a, a man who beats his wife. And of course we pay attention and we try to liberate and empower the, the, the abused woman. And she has to be empowered. She has to uh, uh, find a way to leave this man without being killed or hit or whatnot. That is very good work. And this work is being done. But I believe it's very important to empower somehow, to counsel in a way, to heal the man who feels the need to be an oppressor. And this is very difficult. It's very difficult if they asked us, would you be Trump's counselor or Hitler's counselor or Leopold II's counselor? If we can reach and unlock the, uh, the mechanism of oppression from the oppressors, maybe this way, what we believe in anthropology, which is really human rights and human equality uh, and, and the wealth of humanity, maybe this uh, will reach the wider population. I don't know if I made any sense here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, my question is also related to one issue that uh, there is a emerging trend of uh, a kind of sense of uh, decanonizing uh, de anthropologies. Because nowadays many anthropologists, uh, uh, anthropological studies, particularly in India, they uh, have a claim of just uh, 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 they were uh, retained by white people, uh, so it is a kind of racist uh, uh, thinking. Uh, but we know that anthropologists should also study uh, racism and racist. 
but uh, not become like them, not uh, uh, purport uh, it in academia. It is a kind of uh, mythological lessons about the danger uh, uh, of, of going native and, 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 and the philosophical or mythological lessons about <clears throat> the difference between empathy and sympathy and uh, the, the philosophy of science that points out the difference between issues and the person. So uh, what is your take on, on the very issue of uh, decanonizing anthropology? Yes. You're asking me right here. Yes, yes. I am not completely ready to answer this question. Uh, I don't know. I think we have a long way to go and we all have to, to, to experiment with ways, you know. Uh, so Puja Soni has raised his, uh, her hand. So uh, I request her to say a reflection, yes. Uh, my follow-up question to Ellie would be regarding the oppression. Um, you spoke about, um, you know, anthropology playing a role in fighting oppression. But is it not um, a natural tendency of humans to have two groups, the oppressed and the oppressor? Now, just look at psychoanalysis. It's, it's all about, you know, like um, uh, defining what is... Um, oppression and and for example in psychoanalysis the the root of a dream comes out of the repressed memories right so how um how do you think anthropology um you know should fight oppression is it even possible uh, i'll tell you but, my, my theory um, sorry excuse me you, you didn't finish uh, yes, with gender studies and so on, maybe the dynamics of the oppressor and the oppressed uh, could change. But um, anthropology, anthropology is is it its main main aim to fight uh, oppression? Um, thank you. No, no. Uh, the uh, aim of anthropology has never been established as its main aim to fight oppression. But the way that I see it, because we are at a very crucial point in human history, I see anthropology as an excellent tool, perhaps a unique tool, to give the message to people that it isn't true, it's false, it's constructed, that we think that some lives matter more than other lives. And in general, we live in hierarchical societies. So we, we, we grow up in societies that we believe that some lives are more important than others. So if a homeless person dies, maybe there will be no family who will look for that person or to bury him. Is his life less important than the life of a prime minister, for example? And I work with young people. And many of those people are quite privileged because they attend expensive educational institutions. And they are, 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 you know, they live with, with help at home. They have, you know, domestic help, you know, and so forth. And for them to teach them anthropology is extremely difficult. They are very good kids, like all, all kids are good. That's not the problem. They're not bad people. They, they don't say, okay, I want to go out in the world and I want to do bad, you know. But to, to make them understand how it was to live a traditional life, even in the beginning of the century, even 
in their grandfather's time and today in some places in the world is so so strange, so different than what they live. So they, they, they listen to ethnographic cases like science fiction. My feeling is that the more we can spread anthropological knowledge through ethnographic examples, through studying various cultural contexts and reach a point where to some extent the difference and the other will not scare us, but we will just see it as something different, but we won't be scared from it to some extent, of course then maybe, just maybe, that could be um, uh, a path to take. I don't know if I answer. I feel I didn't answer your question well, but that's all that came to my mind. Uh, thank you so much. <clears throat> so uh, we had uh, uh, almost about to touch uh, uh, 10 here. So uh, it was very uh, uh, important and very, uh, I would say, inspiring session. And uh, we are very uh, blessed with uh, uh, Ellie's uh, presentation and uh, her deep thought as uh, uh, we have just uh, uh, experienced how her uh, analysis, particularly her quest of uh, anthropological insight is very deep and that is very motivating for all of us. So for a uh, vote of the thanks, I would uh, request uh, Amniti Pradhanji to offer vote of thanks of today's session. Uh, thank you, Randir. Uh, I am Amniti Pradhan on behalf of Sadhya Sachakra and Vishwaniram Center for Asian Blossoming, would like to thank our today's chief speaker, Dr. Ili Maria Papa Michel, for our very beautiful presentation and patiently question, answering all our questions. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you from the bottom of our heart. I also would like to thank our today's another speaker and our mentor, Professor Anand Kumar Giri, for his uh, deep presentation as always. So we learn a lot. Thank you, Anantavai. I would also like to thank our other participants, uh, Professor Ganluigi, Professor Puja Shoni, for their uh, interactive uh, participation in our webinar. Thank you, Ganluigi, and thank you, Madam Puja Shoni. I would like to thank all our Facebook participants and the Zoom platform participants for encouraging us always in our webinar and we're learning with us. Thank you all. Pardon me if I've forgotten anybody's name. The last, not the least, I would like to thank today's moderator, but normally he is the convener, Professor Randir Kumar Gautam, for arranging and executing all these events very successfully. I can, we cannot thank him enough for always what he does. Thank you, Randir, and thanks. Thank you all, and good night. Thank you, and thank have you. a good night. Thank you so much. Thank you.